Welcome everyone. I'm David Leonhardt, the writer of the Times main morning email newsletter called The Morning. Uh, I've been at the Times for more than 20 years in a variety of roles, Washington bureau chief, op-ed columnist, and others. This year, the New York Times opinion section has been producing a multi-part series called The America We Need. I was on the team that conceived of it and contributed several pieces. Our view is that too often our nation didn't live up to its founding ideals and that the pandemic was showing how the poor and how people of color lacked equal income, wealth, opportunity, and perhaps most shockingly, the likelihood of living anywhere near as long as more well-off Americans. The last chapter of our series focused on the economy we need. And today we're gonna to take up some time talking about exactly that question with two of some of the best qualified people in the country to talk to us about it. Our program is being recorded. It'll last about 45 minutes and it's structured in three parts. We're excited to have an extended discussion with uh, two of the contributors to the series, the two people I just mentioned, mentioned Robert Reich and Ai Jin Pu. You'll have a chance to put questions to them um, or to me or to Kevin Delaney, the editor of the series, as part of that. We will close with a special poem about work read by Akire Ate, uh, Anau Dewan from Hamilton, Lexi Underwood from Little Files Everywhere, and the actress Danusha Trevena. But first, we are going to start off with a discussion about pay. When you get down to it, compensation is at the root of so many issues of inequality and fairness, and there are few things that most people are less willing to talk about than how much money they make. We wanted to make dis the discussion less abstract, so we asked Times readers to share what they earned, uh, and more than 1,100 brave people did so. Today, we're lucky to be joined for the first part of the program by three of those readers. From our piece, How Much Money Americans Actually Make, we have Jay Highfill from Overland Park, Kansas. We have Carisha Harris from Avon, Connecticut. And we have Yishu Dai from Brooklyn, New York. I'd like to ask each of you to introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about what you do, and then just jump right in um, uh, with what we typically dance around in social situations, which is how much do you make and, and do you think it's fair? And thank you again for joining us. Jay, why don't you start since I read your name first? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm Jay Heifel. I'm a labor economist and I work as a workforce consulting, uh, in workforce consulting in workforce productivity and labor markets. And uh, I earned $236,000 last year. Um, and whether that's fair, uh, you know, from the perspective, it's what the market will bear, that's uh, arguably fair. But when I think about, there are a lot of people that are well qualified, that work very hard, uh, that have a lot of expertise, and they earn a fifth to a tenth of that amount. I think it's a little ludicrous for me to suggest that that's a fair salary. So it's unfair when you think of the disparity of salaries we have. Karisha, you're up next. Okay, so I'm Karisha, and I am a social media manager at a university. Um, I have about 15 years of experience, and last year I made $70,000. And uh, to the question of whether or not I think that's fair, uh, quite honestly, I don't, uh, being very honest. Uh, my, my current salary, quite honestly, is based on my prior salary. Very often, that's the position I have found myself in that no matter how many skills I've acquired and how much more experience I've gained from one role to the next, uh, the first question I'm asked is, well, what did you make in your previous job? And that's just what we're going to pay you. Uh, that's the, the situation I, I'm actually in in my current role, yet you step into roles like the one I'm in and you are finding that you're actually doing five to seven roles. You're, uh, people hear social media manager and they think, oh, you're just the person who tweets, well, no, it's crisis management, it's brand reputation management, it's strategy, it's uh, careful planning, it's sort of being the, the conduit for a two-way conversation between your brand and your audience in a way that no one else experiences it, and to sort of pay that person a, a lower rate than others or to base it on uh, work that really is irrelevant to, to the work that you're doing uh, is fundamentally unfair. Yishu, you're up. 
Yeah, um, my name is Yishu. I work at a bank and I work in sort of, you know, uh, financial crime risk assessment in that kind of role, kind of compliance kind of role. Um, I make $70,000 per year. And, you know, I'm hesitant to say whether or not that is fair, just because um, we use that word in many different ways. And, you know, that word just carries so many different meanings. And so I guess what I would just say is that, you know, that that salary is something that I find comfortable to live with. Um, it is a competitive pay given my number of years of experience and, you know, um, the employment the employing hiring practices at my company, I think is lawful. So in that sense, I think it is fair, but you know, that's a very limited definition. Well, first of all, I just want to thank each of you again for being willing to participate in this. I mean, it, it's, it's interesting that there's such a taboo around this in American culture. It's not the case in all cultures, right? And in, 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 in some other countries in Europe and elsewhere, the idea of kind of talking about pay is, is sort of a normal and natural thing. Um, I, I'm interested, and let's go in reverse order here. Yishu, you, you'll go first. I'm interested, what do you think, do you think that having more transparency around pay in the United States and having more people know whatever Everyone made. Um, uh -huh. Do you think that would make a difference? I think it could, but I wouldn't say that. I, I, I just personally wouldn't put so much hope in it. I guess, I guess the way I look at it is that, you know, the employment relationship between an employee and an employer is just very fundamentally um, about unbalanced. Um, you know, the employer just has so much more power than the employee. Um, and the employer is the person choosing how choosing out of a couple hundred different applicants for, you know, whoever they think might be the best to do the job. Whereas like the employee, like, you know, I have no choice but to work because I need to pay all my bills. And, you know, I often just have like, you know, if I'm lucky, I have like a couple to choose between, but you know, like that's just, you know, just in terms of like the number of choices, I have far less than they do and they have all sorts of protections and power. And so, for me, I think anything, any law or any policy that would sort of tilt that power dynamic is fair in a sense. And so transparency is just one of them. Like Carisha mentioned, like um, her previous employers asked how much she uh, used to make at, or at her old roles and at her current role. You know, in some states that, that question is illegal. And so laws like that I don't you know that doesn't that's not necessarily transparency per se but I think just anything that prevents um, employers from sort of like you know even exercising their tremendous power even more um, because they're going to look for the cheapest option right and so they don't care how much you want to make so I promise we're going to talk about the power dynamic in the, in the discussion. <laughs> Karisha, what do you think? Uh, transparency, power dynamic, what do you think um, would make sense in terms of addressing the levels of inequality we have in our country? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting because I feel like for the first time in a long time, people are starting to be much more transparent about their salaries. And I know when I first entered the workforce, this was just you you did not talk about it. You didn't talk about your, your entry level salaries. You didn't really have a lot of discussions with your colleagues about if you got a promotion or if you got a raise. And I think that what that's created is a really unequal system over time where you have folks who don't even realize that they're being tremendously underpaid oftentimes for the same, if not more work, because no one's talking about it. If you, if you don't have these conversations, you, you sort of find yourself in the same situation from job to job, role to role, promotion to promotion, uh, really being underpaid and undervalued for what you bring to the table. So I think I've seen a lot more uh, open and frank discussions around compensation and salary. And I think that's the only way that things are going to get better is if we start talking about it. Jane, what do you think? What should change, if anything, in the system? I think employers need to publish the pay rates of everybody in the firm openly so that everybody can see them. I've been seeing a movement in this direction, and it's not unheard of, because uh, certainly in public institutions, we already see this. But what I, I think employers don't understand is that that would actually help them. Uh, for example, we know that women earn about 80% of what men do. Some of that's due to occupation, but some of that's due to flat out discrimination right in the workplace. And so for an employer to be compliant, 
they spend so much time trying to figure out, should I pay this person more than this person? Can I justify it based on performance? And a lot of it's really fuzzy. And if it's all published, then they've got to be able to say, okay, if I'm paying a white man more than this woman, I'm going to have to justify it because that woman's probably going to be knocking on my door. And I just think it will make things more equitable, but I also think it'll make things a lot easier for the employers and they don't realize that. Yeah. Well, again, thanks to all three of you for not for participating the first time and then participating even more deeply here. We really appreciate it. Um, Thank you. Uh, and good luck to all of you. Thanks. We're now going to shift the discussion to what fair pay looks like and how that intersects with the future of work. Um, and we are joined by Ai Jin Poo, the co-founder of the National Domestic Workers Alliance and the director of the advocacy group Caring Across Generations, as well as Robert Reich, the former Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. Um, uh, he is now a professor at UC Berkeley. He's written many books and many articles. His upcoming book is The System, Who Rigged It? how we fix it. Um, thank you both for joining us. Thanks for having Thank you, David. So let's start by trying to do a quick diagnose, diagnosis here of what the problem is. Ajin, why don't you go first? What, when we think about this notion that America needs a raise, um, that America isn't making enough money, how do you think about that uh, kind of on the top level? I think about a couple of things. So one is that long before there was a pandemic, there was an epidemic of low wage work in America where we had millions of jobs where women and people of color disproportionately, but millions of low wage workers were working incredibly hard and still couldn't make ends meet, couldn't pay the bills, didn't have any resilience, any savings, and many of them didn't have access to paid sick days, paid time off, health care, any kind of a safety net. and that reality has just permeated so much of our economy. And I think it's a symptom of this larger pattern where we've sort of lost the thread. We've lost the thread that, that our economy is powered by workers and it's powered by workers who are also human beings with families and needs and hopes and dreams, children to take care of, elders to take care of, and somehow our safety net has failed to keep us safe and so much of work doesn't pay and i think that now is the time now that this pandemic has revealed not only that so many workers are working in unsustainable ways but that these workers are essential essential to our safety essential to our well-being and essential to our ability to rebuild out of this crisis and so we have a moment of opportunity to address and pull the thread back of the dignity of work in this country. Bob, uh, before I ask you to add to that, I should have I should have said at the, the start that readers can ask questions um, and we encourage them to do so. Um, so pose your questions to Ijen or Bob. I'm using the Q&A feature in Zoom and we will get to them in a bit. So um, uh, Bob, what would you add to that, um, uh, that description of, of what's wrong? Well, I think a lot of it comes down to bargaining power. Uh, Yishu used the word power, uh, and I think that is the operative term here because most workers today uh, don't really have any bargaining power. Uh, if you went back to the 1950s, David, you'd see that about uh, a third of all private sector workers belong to a union. Uh, that gave them bargaining power. Today, 6.4% of workers in uh, the private sector belong to a union. I mean, almost no bargaining power at all. A and given that employers can so readily outsource work uh, around the country and around the world, and also so readily reclassify workers as independent contractors, uh, workers really don't have any bargaining power whatsoever. At the same time, at the other end of the wage spectrum, You've got people like Jeff Bezos, who in one day last week made uh, $13 billion, uh, billion, not, not million, 
13 billion dollars in one day. And that wasn't because Jeff Bezos is so much cleverer than anybody else, it's because antitrust laws uh, have not been used against uh, Jeff Bezos firm, Amazon, or any of the other uh, big high tech firms, the, the CEOs of whom testified yesterday. And in other words, the market is rigged, uh, not only with regard to antitrust but, uh, and labor law, but many other laws. Uh, and that rigging makes it almost impossible for workers to get the bargaining power they need. Can, can I ask both of you to help unpack this question of why unions matter for a second? Because there's this, right, this theory that would suggest, economic theory that would suggest, well, maybe they shouldn't matter, right? That, that if I work at a place and my employer is paying me less than what my market worth is, I can leave and I can go to another employer. Um, and so you sort of think about that theory and it seems like, well, why should unions matter? Um, people are going to make their market uh, rate uh, based on how productive they are. And if they're not, they'll leave and go play some, some, go someplace else. And yet, when we look at the evidence, you know, like the, this study recently by a team of economists at Princeton and elsewhere, where they kind of looked at the US economy over decades, we see, in fact, that people in unions make substantially more money than, than similar workers not in unions. Why? Uh, well, let me have a take a crack at that, and then Ijen, maybe you can uh, follow up. Uh, the big issue is that when you have a certain percentage of your workforce in unions, uh, they can say to the employer essentially, uh, either take us or leave us. That is, you don't, you employer, you don't have many other options. Uh, in 1958, for example, uh, the big automakers uh, had to deal with the UAW. Uh, and the UAW was the bargaining agent for all of the workers uh, who were in the automobile industry. Uh, and therefore, the UAW had huge power to negotiate higher wages and get a what they consider to be a fair portion of the benefits and profits. Right now, uh, workers, even UAW workers, uh, have very, very little bargaining leverage. Uh, in those days, GM was the largest employer in the United States. Today, Walmart is the largest employer in the United States, and those Walmart workers don't even have a union. Hi, Jen, how would you describe why unions matter? Well, I would approach the question from another direction to say, you know, I've been working with domestic workers for the last 22 years, the nannies, the house cleaners, the home care workers who work inside of our homes. And in the New Deal, when our collective bargaining rights were established through the passage of the National Labor Relations Act, Southern members of Congress refused to support the National Labor Relations Act and the Fair Labor Standards Act, which established the minimum wage, if they included protections for farm workers and domestic workers who were black workers at the time. So in a racist, racist exclusion, those laws were put into place and domestic workers were excluded from the right to unionize and collectively bargain, as well as rights to minimum wage and overtime, which have been addressed over time. But what has, what has followed in that racial exclusion is the fact that for generations, domestic workers have worked poverty wages without access to any kind of safety net without access to 82% of domestic workers came into the pandemic without a single paid sick day, no access to health care, and the isolation, right? There's really no leverage to negotiate for better standards, better pay, better wages. And so for generation after generation, we are still struggling to have domestic work recognized as real work. It's still referred to as help, right? And it has everything to do with race and with gender, right? The first domestic workers in this country were enslaved Black women. And ever since, this work has, as a profession, been associated with Black women and immigrant women of color. And so all of these dynamics around power and hierarchies of power are enshrined in a labor market that has concentrated power at the top, to Robert's point and pushed down all the pressure on workers who have the least amount of power. And the only way to rebalance it is through organizing, through collectivizing our power. You mentioned that this is, in your beginning, you mentioned this, this is sort of a moment, right? That, that you could imagine this is a moment where we can change some of these trends. Speaking particularly about domestic workers, 
Um, and it's interesting when you, you were making me think of a few different things there. I would say to anyone watching, if you're looking for a great piece of history, the book Fear Itself by Ira Katz Nelson tells the longer version of the story, Ajin, that you just told about basically how the New Deal was bought essentially um, uh, with Southern support by excluding Black Americans. Um, and over time, some of that, that those laws got more inclusive, but the legacy has never, has never ended. Um, what would it have to look like now um, for us to, what policies would need to change uh, in order to have an economy that produces uh, consistently rising living standards, um, uh, specifically for domestic workers um, uh, and for, for workers of color, but broadly for the working class and the middle class and, and lower income Americans? You wanna take a first stab at that, Robert? Uh, well, I'm happy to. I, I mean, uh, David uh, Igen points out uh, the institutional and systemic racism in our system, uh, and that is pervasive, and that has to be addressed. Uh, and uh, there are various ways of addressing that, and there's an entire national debate going on about that. But in addition to addressing systemic racism, we also have to address this issue of bargaining, of, of, of of lack of bargaining power uh, that is really uh, in the bottom half of the entire workforce. Uh, I mean, the median wage uh, of the typical worker in America uh, has barely increased over the last 40 years. Um, a huge amount of the benefits of our economy has gone to the top. This is bad for everyone because it means there's not enough purchasing power uh, in the bottom half or even for that matter, the bottom 80% to keep the economy going. Uh, one reason that the economy has become so fragile uh, is because so many workers simply don't have the wherewithal, even before the pandemic, uh, to keep the economy going. So the changes that have to be made in uh, antitrust laws, uh, in labor laws, uh, in everything having to do with discrimination and discrimination laws uh, and job discrimination, uh, but you see, that begs the central question, which is, where do you get the power to make the changes in these laws? Uh, I mean, if most of the power is in the hands of a fairly small group of very wealthy people in this country, uh, then uh, you're in trouble. Uh, and I think that the issue that we face in the next election and in the next decade uh, is how we disperse power, how we make sure that more people in this country have the power they need to affect not only the economy, but also our democracy. I have a few things to add. I absolutely, I couldn't agree more with what Robert just laid out. And I would say specifically for a group like domestic workers, we've created a legislation called the National Domestic Worker Bill of Rights that not only addresses historic exclusions and ways in which this workforce has been discriminated against, but creates a new framework for rights and a voice for this workforce for the 21st century. And the thing that I would just really note about this is that these jobs, caregiving jobs, are gonna be a huge share of the jobs of the future. We have a large and growing older population in this country and a huge need for care work um, at the, in the home in particular, in the home and community-based setting. I mean, we've just seen the devastation in nursing homes, but most people want to age at home in their communities and we don't have the workforce in place. And in fact, the average annual income of a home care worker is $16,000 per year. And so we often lose our best caregivers to other low wage service sectors because they can't survive doing this work. And so I think, you know, the whole conversation about the future of work has really focused on and maybe fetishized automation, artificial intelligence and technology. And the truth is, is that we've got workers who are here now, who are essential, who are providing essential services. They're going to be a huge share of the jobs of the future. And the opportunity is to make them good jobs. And I think it's a core part of any economic recovery strategy. If you think about if we invested in making every childcare job and every home care job a living wage job with benefits, economic mobility, and a union, those jobs, that would not only benefit those workers and their families and give them spending power, but it would, these are also job enabling jobs. 
jobs that enable other working families to go and participate in the workforce every day, knowing that the most important aspects of their lives, the people they love most are in good hands. So I would say we have to think about investing in the workers who are the service workers powering our economy that we know we're going to need and making those jobs good jobs through raising wages, strengthening bargaining rights. And I'll also say that right now we have millions of essential workers who have for months been putting their lives on the line to keep us safe as grocery workers, as delivery workers, as cooks, as home care workers, and they still don't have protections. Right? We've been working on an essential workers bill of rights with Senator Warren and Representative Ro Khanna. We were able to get a few of those provisions into the HEROES Act, which the House passed. The Senate still has not acted on the HEROES Act. We are waiting for that to happen, for essential workers to get essential protections, and that can happen in the next two weeks. So we're not even talking about long range solutions here. There are, there are choices we can make right here, right now, that will make a huge difference in the lives of American workers. Let me ask you just one more question before we turn to reader questions. Is profit sharing an important part of this picture? Um, do you, what do you each think about the idea where companies essentially say, we're gonna take a portion of our profits and we're gonna distribute them to workers? Is that a good way to align incentives between companies and workers? Or would you rather sort of have a system in which um, uh, people's pay is basically coming through collectively bargained um, wages and not so much tied to profits? Uh, David, if you're asking me, I, I think profit sharing uh, is a very good idea. It was a major force, actually, in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, Sears Roebuck, for example, uh, had profit sharing that was so uh, large uh, that its workers by 1950 uh, owned a quarter of the entire company, and the typical Sears Roebuck salesman uh, or salesperson retired in the 1950s with more than a million dollars uh, in value, in, in wealth, in today's dollars. Uh, but we, we've given that up. Uh, the only places you find profit sharing really now are in uh, the highest precincts of high tech companies uh, where uh, stock options are given to the so-called talent. Uh, I mean, uh, if just to give you a, a, a sense of what the difference might be, if Amazon uh, gave uh, every one of its 848,000 employees uh, something in the order of what Sears Roebuck gave its huge number of employees in the 1950s, each Amazon worker would be worth about uh, almost $400,000 right now. Hi, Jim, do you have any thoughts about profit sharing or should we go to read your questions? I think it's a great idea. I think profit sharing and power sharing. Okay, um, I, I'm so used to writing that I called them reader questions. Of course, they're viewer questions. Um, uh, we have a lot of them here. So let me try to get to a bunch and also maybe combine a couple. Um, and we'll try to sort of go through them uh, uh, succinctly so we can get to a bunch. Deb Christensen asks, in 1944, FDR spoke about an economic bill of rights. What should be included in the 2020 version of the economic bill of rights? Hi, Jen. One thought I have is the idea of universal family care, the idea that all of us could contribute to one fund that we all benefit from that helps us pay for child care, long term care and paid family leave. Basically, everything we need to take care of our families while we're working across the lifespan. Excellent. Bob. Uh, well, I'd go along certainly with that, and I'd add uh, medical care, universal medical care. I don't care whether you call it Medicare for all or come up with some other term, uh, but we're the only advanced country that doesn't have uh, a system that ensures everybody. And I think after the pandemic, David, uh, there will be more sympathy toward the need for some of this. Uh, also, paid sick leave, uh, absolutely critical. And I think after this pandemic, again, people understand the importance of all of that. It's interesting, if you go through FDR's uh, Economic Bill of Rights, you see that most European countries after the Second World War adopted almost all of those provisions, but the United States did not. Yeah. Um, and one other thing I might add uh, to consider is we've essentially had, it's localized, but we've essentially had a guarantee of 13 years of public education in this country for about a century now. 
um, seems to me there might be an argument that 15 might, right, might now be the right number to guarantee or something more than we guaranteed in the middle of the 20th century when the economy was very different from what it is now. Uh, absolutely. Uh, if we were talking, you know, just even 10 years ago about how to increase wages, education uh, would have come up earlier in our conversation. I think the reason it hasn't is because so many people with a college degree are not doing well and have not done well over the last 10 years. So it's, it's certainly not the answer, but it is a piece of the answer. Uh, and undoubtedly, we need to think about education not just as a personal investment, but as a public good. And it's interesting, you know, this work by um, Anne Case and Angus Deaton on deaths of despair has gotten a lot of attention. If if people want the long version, they should read the book by that of that name by them. If you want the shorter version, you can look, Google some of the pieces that have been in the Times on that. Um, but what's interesting to me is they have this sort of divide, this central divide in their book. And it's that for people above the divide, life has tended to get better in the United States over the last couple of decades. And for people to lo below the divide, it has not gotten better. And that divide is education. Right. And so, as you said, Bob, it doesn't guarantee raises, as we've seen over the last decade, but boy, it drives a lot of the gaps we, we have in our society. OK, next question. We have a few reader questions about what factors should determine an individual's compensation. So one of them is, isn't your bargaining power determined by the value you create and contribute in your work? How would you each answer that? I would say that um, one of the things that the pandemic has revealed is just how much work that is happening every day has been invisible to most of us and taken for granted. And understanding now just how essential so many of, so much of the work that's invisible is, it begs the question, what else may we not be seeing? And could it be that there is in inherent dignity and value in all work, right? And that part of our work in this next period is to reestablish the dignity and the value, the sense of value that everyone can have, the ability to take pride in what you do as a worker, no matter what you do, right? And I do think that compensation is tied to that, but it's also a different cultural orientation that I think we must embrace coming out of this pandemic. Uh, and David, bargaining power uh, is not just related to how much you contribute uh, in terms of what other people are willing to pay you, uh, but bargaining power has a context, and that context is really important. Uh, somebody who's unionized has much more bargaining power than somebody who isn't. Somebody who is working for a gigantic company that is a monopoly that can hold down wages has far less bargaining power than somebody who is not working for a monopoly. Uh, somebody who actually uh, is in a, a contractual relationship uh, in which that person is not allowed uh, to even negotiate with any other employer uh, has far less bargaining power uh, than anybody else. So you've got to look at the structure of laws and rules and regulations. And different countries at different times have different structures. The United States used to have a structure that gave much more bargaining power to the typical worker. Okay, we're running short on time. I'm going to give the last question here to Ruth, who asks a really good one, and, and ask each of you to, to take this on. Um, she asks, as an individual, how can I make a difference? So for all the people out there who, who are also concerned about these trends, concerned about inequality, concerned about living standards, and they're sort of wondering, well, what can I do? Um, uh, what would you each tell them? Go ahead, Bob. Oh, uh, I was waiting for IJ. Uh, I, would, uh, I would say uh, organize and mobilize politically and economically. That is, at your workplace, maybe organize a union, uh, if you dare to. Uh, in terms of politics, uh, we have an election coming up. Uh, organize and mobilize your friends and people in your city, uh, people you know who are in swing states. Uh, make sure that they are, uh, are energized to participate because you see, there's nothing more important as John Lewis, the late great John Lewis uh, kept telling us uh, than voting. Uh, voting determines what the rules of the economic game, not just the political game, but the economic game are going to be. And that has a lot to do with how much power people ultimately have. I, and I'll just, I couldn't agree more. And I'll just add to really support workers who are organizing. Um, there are going to be a lot of campaigns. Teachers are organizing, others are organizing, and they need the support of the general public. We need a majoritarian movement 
for the dignity and the protection of workers in this country. Um, and um, I would also say that um, this election is also about letting all of the candidates who are running for office near you know that you care about workers' rights, that you care about the dignity of work and the quality of work that will be available to you and your community and generations after you. Yeah, and actually th those points, uh, I'll just close this part of the discussion by noting that I find it interesting that over the last decade or so, we've had a, a bunch of really important grassroots movements, right? Um, there aren't that many people that like all the different grassroots movements, but we've had a bunch of really important ones. We have the Tea Party, um, we've had Black Lives Matter, and we've had the so-called Trump resistance. Um, and all of them have influenced American politics in some pretty significant ways. I think it's interesting that none of them have been organized around this idea of worker power. And it seems like that is another place where potentially, Black Lives Matter has gotten the closest, but it, that is another place where potentially we could have a grass, grassroots movement that, that had a significant impact um, on what life is like in the United States. Thank you both for joining us. Um, we're lucky to have you and, and hear your thoughts. And I would encourage everyone to read anything uh, you see with I, Jen, or Bob's name on it. Um, uh, we're now going to turn to the next part of our program, um, which is giving you a little bit of poetry um, that tries to capture the sense of powerlessness, of being given commands and orders all day. Um, uh, this poem uh, entitled Workers' Instruction Manual is a collaborative piece by cabbies, street vendors, retail workers, and nannies who attended a workshop in New York City run by the literary nonprofit Pen America. We're going to share a recording of the poem being read by a few celebrities uh, with appearances by Lexi Underwood, who stars in Hulu's Little Fire Everywhere, Akire Ate Anau Duan, who starred in the Broadway production of Hamilton, and Danusha Trevino. 5 a.m. Check the hot tank to make sure it's working. 6 a.m. Take me to 70th and Central Park West. Please go slowly. I'm pregnant. 6.01 a.m. Do you have today's menu on a side window? 6.59 a.m. Did you put your ID badge around your neck to avoid getting a ticket? 7 a.m. Did you fill up the water in the tanks? 7.15 a.m. I'm going to La Guardia. Can you open the door for me? I'm coffee impaired. 7.30 a.m. Check the tank. Is there hot water in case the inspector shows up? 7.35 a.m. Go get a screwdriver. The towel bar fell off. The screws have to be tight. 7.37 a.m. Do you have everything ready before we open the window, like utensils and bags within reach? 7.45 a.m. Make sure you greet customers by saying good morning and thank you. 7.50 a.m. You have to work on the 28th. I have to attend a conference in Las Vegas. 8 a.m. Come to the house. No, wait. Uh, maybe come about 10 minutes earlier. 8.02 a.m. You know what? Just come for your regular time to take them to school. We're never ready when you arrive. 8.05 a.m. Make sure you have your ID badge visible around your neck while working at all times. 8.30 a.m. Remind customers to step to the side while waiting for their orders to be ready and take the next customer. 8.55 a.m. One spicy, one veggie. 9.55 a.m. Uh, give me two spicy day. 10 a.m. Can you do my data entry today? 10.20 a.m. Take the boys to 110 Park. 10.21 a.m. Share a small kalalu and saltfish with two bananas and one dumpling. 11 a.m. I have more data entry for you to do. 11.37 a.m. I need a patty, spicy beef patty. 11.55 a.m. Two fried dumpling. 12 noon. Stand against the wall. 12.34 p.m. Meet us like the last time. Just come inside the park above the playground. 12.44 p.m. Is it possible for you to work today? The snowstorm is not so bad. 12.45 p.m. Meet me at the entrance of 97th Street and Central Park East like last time. 1 p.m. 
Sterilize baby's bottle, wipe chair, put the cover on baby's play mat. 2 34 p.m. You're done. 3 p.m. Follow me. 3 02 p.m. Take him to the park to slide in the snow. 3 03 p.m. Huh. They said it's a storm day? No, no, it's beautiful outside. Just look out the window. 3 15 p.m. Can you take the baby out? It's nice out. 3.16 p.m. The night staff at the depot will clean the inside of the truck with hot water to get it ready for us tomorrow. Make sure to leave the keys inside the truck. 3.19 p.m. Don't let the boys sleep past 4 p.m. Feed them dinner at 5 p.m. Put the desitin on really thick. 3.30 p.m. Fill this card out completely. Understand? 4.50 p.m. Just let her sleep five to 10 minutes more. 4.56 p.m. Oh, shoot, I actually may need you a week from today, so keep it open. I may not need you though. 5 p.m. I will need you to work late today as I won't be able to make it home till 6 p.m. 5 p.m. At 5.15 p.m., you can give them their dinner. 5.01 p.m. Go to lunch. 5.30 p.m. If you wanted to go, go ahead. 6 p.m. Can you work until 9 p.m.? 6.05 p.m. We must meet. 6.21 p.m. Need you to work on Valentine's Day. 6.59 p.m. Don't rewrite the question. Just leave it. 7 p.m. Around 7.15, you can put the baby's bottle in the warmer. 7.45 p.m. You can put her in her bed now. 7.55 p.m. Take off your shoes. 8, 10 p.m. You've got to leave the building. 10 p.m. Help yourself to teas or whatever. 1.35 a.m. Give her one more ounce. 2.44 a.m. Do not let her sleep on her tummy. That is powerful stuff. Um, thank you to our guest readers and thank you to everyone who, who wrote uh, that poem. Um, the worker's instruction manual will be included in an upcoming book called Social Poetics by Mark Nowak, who uh, ran the Penn workshop. Um, uh, thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, I want to leave you with one thought, which is it, it's hard to think of a time um, uh, that is more alarming uh, in many of our lives. We're in uh, the midst of a deep economic downturn. It's one that came on top of years, if not decades, of alarming trends for large portions of the population, slow growing wages, stagnant wealth. Uh, slow growing, if not falling, life expectancy and other measures. Um, uh, we're now going through this terrible pandemic. Um, uh, and there are so many reasons, um, legitimate reasons, just to feel deeply down about what's going on in the country today. Uh, I'm not going to try to persuade anyone um, uh, that those things are not alarming. They are deeply alarming. But I do think one of the lessons of history is that um, one of the only times where you can see societies make important pivots um, and begin to change for the better uh, is when they're struggling with a, a kind of a, a cavalcade of, of problems like the one we are now. Um, and so um, in some ways it, it is, it can be darkest before the dawn on a lot of these issues. And I think um, there's no guarantee that it will be, um, but that may not be reason for optimism, but is it, it is at least reason um, uh, for some hope. Um, if you want to learn more about this, I encourage you to dig into the series um, that we've done. You can Google the America we need. You can look at the economy we need. You'll find much, much more online about minimum wages, about health care, about sick leave, about climate change, about many other subjects. Um, before we go, I want to give a special thanks to our subscribers. You make um, everything that the New York Times does. Um, uh, this event, uh, our website, our coverage of coronavirus, our coverage of, of politics today, our bureaus in Afghanistan and Iraq and Europe and China, um, as well as our investigations into Harvey Weinstein and so much else. You make all of that possible in a real way. We work for you. So thank you. Um, and don't be shy about what we can do better. Um, thanks also for, to everyone for joining us today. We hope to see you at a Times event again soon. Enjoy your evening.